uh, meeting of the Deerfield Planning Board on Monday. Uh, do you have to record anything, Jen? You're all set? I hit it. You hit it. Uh, Monday, March 22nd at, I think it's 4, 10 p.m. Our typical meetings normally held at the municipal offices are being held remotely with adequate alternate means of public access where required public participation provided, and we have some good public here, in accordance with the governor's order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. And meetings are typically broadcast on FCAT with remote meeting connections noted on the agenda on the website, deerfieldma.us. So roll call. Paul is not available. Max um, may be late. Rachel Blaine? Rachel Blaine here. Yay. Uh, and Mary, haven't heard about her, but expect she'll be coming. Denise? Denise Mason here. Kathy Wetroba? Kathy Wetroba here. Excellent. And Annalee Wolfkull here. So we do have a quorum, which is the four of us. Good. So the majority voting for that is three. Is that correct? That's correct, right? To get a majority vote on something. Huh. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Review mail. We had one piece of mail that came in today on April 1st, 7 p.m. Waitley public hearing regarding a special permit for marijuana cultivation. If anyone is interested. And then actually, it's not quite mail, but I did notice in the recorder this morning. Conway is having a public hearing this Wednesday at 7 p.m. on zoning solar bylaws. So since we're into that, if anyone is interested. Um, that's it for the mail, isn't it? I think, Jen, nothing else. Yes. OK, thank you. And um, I don't believe we have any minutes, so we'll pass on that, even though we don't have Anne Mary. And so we'll move right into um, old business. I think, as I'd mentioned to all of you um, in a previous email, um, we're still getting some legal uh, review of our site plan review and solar bylaws. So um, potentially either at the end of this discussion with accessory apartments or at the end of our meeting, we need to sort of map out our calendar and our time frames with um, when we have our public hearings. And Jen has pulled together a good um, a good time going backwards time frame on that. So we'll take a look at that. But we'll start in with um, accessory departments. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. Um, so the accessory apartments. Oh, there's Anne Mary. Hi Anne Mary. Do you have before we move there? Do you have, we don't have any minutes, right? Yeah, I set them right at the end of the last meeting. Huh. Yep. Did you all receive the meeting? It was over. I shared them out. Ooh. So yeah, I'm, I don't know what happened. You know, things happen. Okay. Well, then we will look at them at our next meeting. Thank you for sending them out so promptly. <laughs> I think that's what confused everybody. It usually takes me a while. <laughs> Thank you, Anne Mary. Okay. All righty. Um, for our, again, the process for our bylaw review, um, Chris is going to summarize the changes since our last meeting, not necessarily go through them inch by inch. Um, and then we can have discussion and hopefully at that point to come to consensus about the bylaws, at which point we would um, move to have them go to public hearing, and then also need to vote on the public hearing. Does that sound like the plan? And recognizing too, after public hearing, we can ad then additionally make changes if need be. Um, so this isn't our last chance, but we certainly would like them to be as clean as they can be. So Chris, Chris Curtis, you're on, thank you. Thank you, Annalee. Uh, and I have to apologize. My camera does not seem to be working on my laptop. So um, hopefully you can hear me. We can. I can. We just surprised you by putting you in the agenda early enough, you know, before my bedtime, honestly. <laughs> so true. 
Um, so uh, about uh, half an hour before the meeting, I sent you all an updated version of the draft bylaw. I unfortunately can't get my computer to share that, that screen either. Um, so we could either ask um, Rachel to share it, which happened last time, or we could just go through it looking at our own individual versions. But while we're thinking about that, Rachel's working on it. Um, I'll explain um, the, the various things that have happened. Uh, we, we've gotten comments from uh, the housing planner at FERCOG, and those are reflected in this version of the bylaw in, it's a, an orange underlined font. We've gotten comments from town council, Lisa Mead, and those are reflected in a purple underlined font. And then we have comments from uh, the board and the public generally that were addressed um, after the last time we discussed this. And those are in the yellow highlighted um, font. So we've gotten a lot of input and some of it just came in kind of at the last minute. So I haven't really had a lot of time to work on this, but I will try to summarize what's uh, what's happened here. So taking this first page, um, we had a uh, suggestion that um, the term floor area should be um, defined. So I've added a definition for floor area because that term is referenced in the bylaw. Um, the yellow highlighted uh, definition for accessory dwelling unit was added um, after our previous discussion, and that comes directly from the new changes to the Zoning Act, Chapter 40A. And then down uh, to Section 3931. Um, Sorry, my computer's doing a weird thing here. Um, in 3931, uh, is, it, is it Alyssa Annalee that was the yes, first Alyssa time Yes, Alyssa LaRose, I think, yes. Yes. From FERCOG. Uh, so she added the term um, single family dwelling unit into several sections of the bylaw, uh, I guess to make clear that we're not talking about duplexes here. Um, we're talking about just single family homes. Um, and then in 3932, you see that same thing um, referenced again. We also made a change in 3932 to allow accessory apartments uh, by special permit in a detached structure. That, that was discussed at our previous meeting. And there were various opinions about that, but I think the general consensus um, seemed to be that um, folks wanted to to allow that. Can you zoom in a little bit, Chris? Thanks, Rachel. This, this is Rachel sharing the screen here. Oh, <laughs> whoever. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, and so I'm, I'm moving down to 3934. And here we have, um, again, some comments uh, and significant changes to the bylaw that have been recommended by Alyssa at FERCOG. Uh, in 3934 3, her suggestion is to add the sentence that says accessory apartments in detached structures, new or existing must comply with setback and maximum lot requirements for its district. So um, I think that's a useful addition, just to be clear about that. We're talking about um, which types of uh, requirements are being met in that section. Then in 3934-4, she's suggesting, um, and I think this is this is a useful suggestion, she's put together an alternative process for um, the transfer 
of a piece of property that has an accessory apartment in it. Um, we had a, a fairly extensive um, process and she's suggesting an alternative version of that, uh, which I think is a little bit cleaner and simpler. So uh, I'll just read this, I guess. In, in this section, she's added the, the language, prior to the issuance of a building permit or special permit, the owner must submit a notarized letter to the planning board stating that they will occupy one of the dwelling units as their primary or permanent or primary residence, except for bona fide temporary absences. Upon sale or transfer of the property to a new owner, if they wish to continue to use the accessory dwelling unit, the new owner must submit within 30 days of the sale a substantially identical notarized letter to the planning board. Notarized letters must be recorded at the Franklin County Registry of Deeds with documentation of recording provided to the building inspector prior to the occupancy of the accessory dwelling unit. So this procedure also is referenced in a later section of the bylaw and it replaces what we had originally um, put in um, the bylaw which was a, a bit more onerous, I guess I would say. And so I, I, I think this is a, a reasonable approach and, and uh, I, I think it makes sense to, to utilize that. Um, I guess I'll just ask if there are any questions to this point. I have a question, Rachel question so Go when we it, talked about separate structures are we making any um so i missed it so I, I went back but the size recommendation for the separate structure i mean we haven't talked that much about it we've talked more about you know um in-law apartments within existing buildings aren't the size recommendations the same whether it's detached or connected chris I didn't think. Well, I'm trying to figure that out, actually. That would make sense. Um, that's a point that might need to be clarified. I think it's it's a good point. I just was, uh, yeah, okay. I will, you know, I will say I'm trying to incorporate the comments from two different um, commenters mm -hmm. here and make sure that they make all sense. Uh, they all make sense, rather. Um, so I, I think, I think that may be something that needs to be addressed in the section, which we're just coming to soon here. Or maybe also too, if we're feeling that as you're cleaning these up, Chris, it, it sounds, are we all feeling that whether it's detached or contiguous, that it would, the size requirements would be the same? I think, I think that, that. that's reasonable. Okay. So then as you kind of clean them up, Chris. Okay. Thanks, Rachel. Well, well, um, I hope you are all able to see the bylaw still. It's unfortunately not showing up on my screen for some reason. We can see it. Um, yep. Okay, good. We're, yeah, we're at so, four, four, four and nine. So I'll just, you know, keep describing where I'm at in the bylaw. So 3934-5 has some yellow highlighted font. And that again is from our last discussion. Um, we did some wordsmithing on the language about having a, um, a separate entrance for the accessory apartment. And we wanted to um, say that it could be um, combined in, into a single front entryway leading to an entry hall or corridor shared with a principal dwelling unit sufficient to meet the requirements of the state building code for safe egress. So that's the new language in that section. In um, number seven under that same section, uh, we have got some language that came from our meeting and some language that came from Alyssa. Um, and the language from our meeting says that the, the size of, this, of the uh, accessory dwelling shall not be larger in floor area, 
floor area than one half the floor area of the principal dwelling or 900 square feet, whichever is smaller. And again, that, that um, language comes directly from the Zoning Act. So I think it's pretty consistent with that. Now, let's added a, a section here on, on floor area. And um, I actually, now that I look at it, I think it duplicates our definition of floor area. So I, I, if, if you look at the orange font, I guess it's showing up. Now that I've got my screen back, it's showing up in blue on Rachel's. Mm -hmm. um, so that floor area section, I think, is is superfluous because we defined floor area earlier in the bylaw. So I, I'm going to suggest we kind of just take that out. Okay. Then moving down a little further to number 12 under that section. Um, hmm. That's interesting. Well, it was the old. So, yeah, it's funny. We don't see it here. No. It was the accessory apartment shall not be occupied by more than three unrelated adult residents, which I think was one of the right. things that Melissa said was problematic. Yeah, that was kind of a controversial section. So that's been deleted now. And um, for some reason, it's not showing up on this version of, of the screen. But that, that section is gone because I think people felt like that was not, um, not something that you wanted. Then moving down to 3941 under the special permit procedures, we had a section um, which was titled Declaration of Covenants under 3942. Um, and that was deleted as part of Alyssa's um, suggestion for, for streamlining that process for um, a property that um, is transferred between one uh, one owner and the next. So again, it's not showing up on on Rachel's version, but that that section three nine four two was deleted, and and then so three nine four two becomes this disabled and handicapped section. That's not new. Then moving down to three nine five zero. I'm sorry, I forget I forget how to put my hand up. I have a question about three nine four two. Okay. Um, I'd like to change that language to um, accessible units. I'd like to take out disabled and handicapped from that language, please. Yes, that, that makes sense. Thank you. Any, anything else on that? I'm just looking for, you know, sort of ableist language. Um, I would like to describe the units instead of the people who live there. Right. You know what I mean? For um, accessible housing units. Does, is that specific enough? Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that's a good change. Okay, thank you. In that first sentence also, as well as the um, title. Yes, I see that. Okay, so 3950 is where Alyssa has um, developed this new language for the transfer of properties, which again is, is a bit more si simple and streamlined than what we originally had. And uh, I guess I'll just read this out loud so that everybody is, um, is um, Well, I think isn't, isn't the gist of it. Now, when there's a transfer of property, they just need to have a notarized letter about their intention to continue the rentals rather than having to apply for a totally new special permit. Is that correct, Chris? That's that's correct. That's the way I understand what she's suggesting. So, so I think that was one of the that was one of the issues that I know you, Anna Lee, had with the bylaw. So I think it fixes that problem. But it still keeps um, the intent of the bylaw is to ensure that that the unit is owner occupied, and um, maybe we should just talk about that for a second. I think that the issue of being owner occupied is is fairly important 
from what I've heard from other communities that have adopted similar provisions, uh, it's a way to make sure that um, it, you know basically doesn't become multifamily housing, um, and you know you, you don't change the character of the neighborhood uh, from a single-family um, neighborhood to a you know multifamily neighborhood. Um, I think there's you know concerns about you know, loud partying or big gatherings and things like that that might happen if you didn't have an owner-occupied unit. Um, that's what I've heard from other communities anyway. So I think it, it's, it's worthwhile having it here. I think it makes the bylaw more saleable to town meeting, um, alleviates maybe concerns that neighbors might have. Uh, they don't have to reapply for anything. They're not reapplying. It's just a matter of uh, it, intention, which then it, it retains the intent. I think it's a terrific idea. I, I wouldn't have yeah. Okay. So then we, it probably won't show up on this version, but, but if, if we scroll down a little bit, there were sections that, that involved the special permit that have been deleted. So 3951, 3952, 3953 all involved special permit and that, that got taken out and replaced with the language that you see. And then um, moving down to 3962, you see the in the blue font in, in section A, the planning board and building inspector, the, the term the words and building inspector were added to that sentence by Lisa Mead, town council. I think that's a fine suggestion. And then moving down further, there was under that section, there was a sec, there was a subsection that got deleted. Um, and that section originally uh, said that the applicant must demonstrate that the accessory apartment has been used prior in the adoption of this bylaw by providing the planning board evidence of such use, including, for example, copies of separate electric and utility bills. Um, the advice from town council was that that might be very difficult to enforce. And so um, I, I deleted that upon, you know, reading her comments. It, it didn't seem necessary, um, so we've taken that out. Then uh, moving into the, the table of use regulations, 2230, you again see the term single family employed here, which was you know repeated earlier in the bylaw. And then we've added a provision for the um, accessory apartments in a detached structure by special permit, which also was um, cited earlier in the bylaw. And then um, further down, we just have a repeat of the definitions. Some folks have, um, have asked why we do it twice. Uh, and again, it's just because Really, that's the way you've done things historically with your bylaw. You have definitions in the individual section and then in a separate section at the beginning of the bylaw. I'm just kind of following the, um, the same standards that you, you already have. Um, and so that term floor area needs to be defined here as well. I'm making a note to myself, uh, but it's the same definition that you saw earlier. So those are the changes. Um, any comments or thoughts about those? Denise? Yeah, I have a question and not, well, it goes into this, but it's not about this specific. It's, I'm just wondering, so, you know, when we're thinking about grandfathering, I'm sure that, you know, there are already properties that are not really compliant, okay? So let's say that there is a property that used to be owner occupied and it was a single family house that was then made into a two family house a number of years ago. Then the owner left and now they're renting both units out. 
So then all of a sudden the owner wants to sell the property, but the electric is commingled. What happens then? Maybe that's a building inspector. I, I don't know. I'm just sort of curious because I'm sure that there, well, I know one for sure, but I, I'm sure that there are properties like that around town. And so are they just grandfathered in or what happens? Well, your, your example wouldn't come into play under this bylaw because it wouldn't be an accessory apartment. It's, it's a two family structure. Yeah. A two family that they want to make back into a single family? No, no, it's it's actually a single family that was made into a two family years ago. And yeah, building space. Yeah, that, that would be a pre existing non conforming condition. Okay. So it would stay that way. And even even when it's sold, it can be sold as is without any as long change. As it was Really? Yeah, as long as it was wasn't an illegal apartment or something. Yes. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Yeah, Chris, my understanding also is though with these previous units, they still have to comply with building building codes, right? So they still have to have good electric, and it doesn't matter if it's split or not. It has to be in compliance with electric laws. Is that well, correct? Yeah. Pam, Don, or Bob? Yeah, yeah, everything has to be in compliance with the building code. This may, this, my question may not be relevant to what we're discussing then, so we can move on. Yeah, it's just not, th this bylaw wouldn't change anything that has already happened in the past. Okay, I don't, okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah, I don't want to weigh, weigh us down with things that aren't relevant to the conversation. Thanks. It's hard to know what's relevant, Denise, so thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Figured I'd ask and I got an answer. <laughs> yes, Jen? So, so in Amherst, they had a rental bylaw, and that's how they would were able to control the existing non-conforming. So it made anybody that had an apartment register their apartment with the town. And that's the way that they went around that issue of how do you control that everybody had to register their rental properties and then you had to make sure that it met all of the building codes because honestly how would bob even know unless he um went there and found out that you know it switched owners and neighbor ratted you know, them out so um so uh, is that a bylaw issue bob or Jen? how does that work because that doesn't sound un that sounds sensible. Sounds like a good idea, actually. Yeah, yeah. no, that's it's, really sensible. It's very intensive. I mean, it's like there's, it's a huge process. I mean, as a matter of fact, that's what I was hired in Amherst to be as their rental yeah. at first. And then I got promoted after 11 months to my next position there. Um, so it's, they have to pay a hundred dollars. I mean, every, everything could be different. It's just that that's a, a college town, you know? So there's hundreds of apartments. Um, and they paid $100 a year to register and to verify the health and safety of everybody's apartment. So it was a separate bylaw, but that's how they were mm -hmm. able um, to manage them. So then let's say there was somebody who sold the house and now they're selling it as a two family. And we actually see it on our records as a single family because it had an in-law apartment. Right. So there, then they would come to, to me and I would say, Okay, we need to do, yeah, exactly. So, you know, it's like, it's not so fast. Yeah, exactly. Unless you can do X, Y, and Z, it's actually still a single family and not a two family. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we would need to make sure that it had two means of egress and that the, there was adequate light and ventilation and that there was uh, fire separation between both the apartment, I mean, blah, blah, blah. There's like right. a whole bunch of things, but, right. but that was the gist of the, that's how they got that, the rental bylaw. So that's different from what these bylaws would be. Yes, because then this would also be any apartment that was rented. Right. right. And that would give Bob a sense for what was where and, and um, some sort of agency to um, blow the whistle on something that was unsafe, mm -hmm. you know, exactly. going about it. I mean, is that so, makes sense, Bob? Is that something that we would work on at a later date then? We could decide that, yeah. Well, be, because another concern is that, you know, I, I happen to know of a certain property 
not mine. And I know that the electricity is not, is not, it's sort of commingled. And when you really think about it, it is really unfair to a renter because they don't know who's, what, what they're paying for. So, you know, it really comes down to the protection of the people renting the place, you know, the safety and the protection. And the neighbors, you know, and neighbors who think that yeah. they're, you know, that too. In a residential neighborhood that doesn't, anyway. Exactly. Okay, so this might okay. be something that we put on our, actually later on in the meeting, I want to talk about sort of creating an inventory list of what yeah. are the things we might like to address. And that would be one of the things that could go on. And, any other questions in relation to these recent changes for accessory apartments or are we at a point where we could, I think the next thing is to um, move and second and vote on um, having this be the draft that then would go to a public hearing. Yep. So. <clears throat> I make a motion to accept the draft. <laughs> I second it. Okay. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Well, we want to, um, um, you know, with the amendments that Chris is making tonight, right? Um, as a as a kind of as a very presentable template for what will go forward. Um, yeah, I think that's yes. Good clarification, Rachel. Yes. <laughs> Kathy, did you have a question? I, I have a little bit of a question. So, by definition, then accessory apartment accessory dwelling is stated it is not to family by the fact of using that word accessory yes okay in the absence of that word then it could be classified as a two family okay but then two family would open the door to, you know, dwellings of larger dwellings, all the, you know, losing all the um, opportunity for, and I think that's also why the rental property would make a great bylaw just because then you'd have a delineation between what was a rental property and what was an accessory apartment. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Can I ask another question too, as it relates to this? So. So because it's it we're talking about um, this concept of uh, making more affordable rentals, would it be at the discretion of the homeowner whether they accepted like a We froze you, Kathy. Yeah. You're talking about section eight? I just want yeah, so so for example, so uh, make affordable rental housing units more available. So would it be at the discretion of the homeowner to accept a section eight voucher or is there any contingency on whether they could or not? Well, the bylaw specifically addressed that issue. So um, I, I guess the answer would be, it, it would be at the discretion of the homeowner. Okay. But a section eight would have to then go through a whole nother set of hoops. I mean, you don't just sure. get a section eight designation right. you, 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 right. that takes some doing yeah so yeah the homeowner could do it but they'd have to then go through that and then that would also be <laughs> I, I would imagine part of the inventory of rental properties yeah. in town you'd understand that which would be great it would because that, i don't think yeah. where it, you know how much low-income housing how much subsidized low-income housing etc we had I think we're below, well below our quota here in South oh, we, and South Oh, I found the inventory. I just found it the other day with my, by the way, the receipt for the, my birth, which is <laughs> super interesting. It cost $125 <laughs> for my parents to have me. Crazy. So Two rooms funny. for six days. Unbelievable. Anyway, wow. but also I found the housing inventory, two-page executive <laughs> summary that Alyssa wrote. So I, I'll forward it along. It's super old, but... It was the beginning of this discussion in for my in my um, tenure on the board. I, I think about our community as a whole, not to hijack this meeting by any means. But you know, I look at some of the community I grew up in in Northampton. It's so gentrified. It's so there is people who just are, 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 can't live there. I mean, it's just where you could live is inaccessible anymore. And, and you know, we have a great community, and um, you know, we are below our quota, and the uh, option to be able to do that, I think would 
be um, definitely positive. And, and I think the key thing about the bylaw is that it doesn't contain any restrictions or prohibitions on, on Section 8. So um, it, it doesn't put any obstacles up for that to happen. Hey, Joel, as an aside, you were worth every penny. <laughs> exactly. But a bargain. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I think we have a motion to accept these bylaws as amended in discussion and it's been seconded and we've had, is there any more discussion? So- I just wanna um, also put it out there that this is a dream realized for me. This has been on the agenda for us to take care of for my whole tenure, like I said. Whoa. And I think that it, it creates in, in Deerfield a, a friendly opportunity that is in keeping with the way people feel about housing in Deerfield. Mm -hmm. um, so, and yes, and. Thank you, Rachel. Okay. All right, so let's have a vote. And I guess the first one in alphabetical order would be Rachel Blaine. I vote yes, Rachel Blaine. And Mary? And Mary Clear, yes. Denise Petropa or Denise Mason? <laughs> Denise Mason, yes. <laughs> Kathy Petropa. You're muted. muted. Kathy Petropa, yes. And Emily Wolfel, yes. So we have it um, unanimous. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, do you want to pop? down now or at the end of the meeting to talk about our next meetings we do have um we do have some calendar planning that we need to do in terms of both uh, setting public hearings as well as having things done in advance of town meeting um so um do we have a date for town meeting because yes we do there it is january or june, june 12th yep. no, it's june 12th it's saturday june Really? It's a Saturday. June 12th, it's a Saturday in the morning. Um, Rachel, I sent you an email because I have something's blocked on my Mac trying to share the screen. So, and I tried to send it to Anna Lee, but I had made up three for the solar, the site plan, and for the accessory apartment, like a timeline. Did you get the email? While she's pulling that up, what we need to do is um, think of the public hearings as well as an adequate time for publicizing the public hearings as well as um, getting it all done before going to town meeting and the warrant and all that. Um, and we'll say before we start that discussion, Chris, um, Lisa Mead, who is working with us from Costas firm, um, I'm not sure. Do you think she actually needs to speak it's, with us? By the way, it's her firm. <laughs> She's the senior. Oh, it's Lisa. Well, there you go. This is okay. This is <laughs> just saying. Right. Wanted to be very clear on that one. <laughs> Let's make sure we don't do that one. Again. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, Lisa is available to speak with us on April fifth if we need. Um, so, in any event, um, wait with that screen sharing. Oh, you want to see it? Sure, do you think, do you sure. Because that's the accessory apartment and it's the, the third one. Oh, third, the, which one? The third, the third attachment. Got it. Oh, you have three attachments for the three different. Yep. I recommend we do this for every um, hearing. Um, so the experience of those of you who have been on the board, certainly much longer than Denise or Kathy or I, um, in terms of public hearings, um, is it reasonable, do you think, to have two of these discussed at, on one evening? Um, we have still for public, we have three public hearings that we need to do, uh, solar, um, accessory apartments, and site plan review. Uh, not all three. Could we do two? Um, solar, accessory apartments, site plan. So 
the site plan review is going to be a snoozer for everyone, but it's really at most probably the most discussion. The other two are more um, more um, technical. Do you think it would be most discussion by the public? Site plan I review? think so. Really? Well, okay. Well, yeah. I, I think because it shakes up a lot of trees in terms of who you know who's saying what and where and when and how. I don't know. I think these other two are more. Accessory apartments is going to be take some real explaining. That's the thing. I don't think solar will take that much explaining. Solar shouldn't. Do we feel that there's much discussion will be needed for solar? Do you think? Okay, so we could put solar either with accessory apartments or site plan review. You know what I heard about solar easements. Okay. Anybody go? To, did anybody go to that thing last week? I want. I meant to. I tried to. About no. solar. Anyway, sorry, that's just a. Uh, I think we could do these two on one night. Which two? Accessory apartments and solar? Okay, and Jen, which is, let's see, this is an accessory apartment. So this is, this is the timeline that I did, and you sort of have to work, you work backwards. So you can see that we're at. Can you make it bigger, please? Thank you. <laughs> Better. You go. So at the bottom it says um, tonight's date 322 planning board reviews zoning amendment proposal and sets the public hearing date. Then I have because of the in, on the uh, right hand column you can see what the requirement is. So we have to have published first publication of the notice of the newspaper cannot be less than 14 days before the public hearing, not counting the date of the hearing. So that would make um, March 29th and April 5th, the two notices that would go into the paper. Um, and that would be posted on our website and out, you know, like on our bulletin board, um, as well as the newspaper. And then you can see that the date that we would set that planning board um, hearing would be April 12th. And that is, it must be within 65 days of the planning board receives the um, the proposal where on the right hand side public hearing must be held within 65 days after the planning board receives the proposal. So we go what's up the proposal, excuse me, what's the proposal? Um, what we did tonight? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, and then you would see that um, the planning board submits the report with recommendations for town meeting on May 21st. And it must be submitted within 21 days of the plan. The planning board must submit, submit this report. And the report, I asked um, Casey what that is. And she's, she said that it's basically just a very basic report about what you're, um, you want to propose, what this, what this bylaw is. An about. abstract, like a, a clear abstract. So, so yeah. And then, and then on that, then this plan, um, then it's, 612, which is town meeting. And then that is the, the, the full time. It says it's within the town clerk within 30 days, but um, Barbara usually does it within two weeks. So if we follow this timeline, we wouldn't be able to combine accessory apartments with um, say solar because we haven't finished solar yet. Well, if you meet Right, that's right. So then I, so then the- oh, 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 we can't, can't we though, we haven't finished it, but what we have is so close to finished. Couldn't yeah. we propose that anyway and then make amendments as we go along? I mean, we've been so, Chris, Chris, where's Chris? I'm looking at him, I'm looking at Chris. <laughs> Chris has been so patient with us. We, we, we've been, going over it and going over it and going over it. And I think that there's a point at which when the public comes and then they say, hey, have you thought about this? We thought, blah, blah, blah. we're gonna go back at it anyway. Yeah, Chris and Bob, I mean, that isn't the main thing that's still outstanding with some input from Lisa is the whole question of the setbacks and height, right? And isn't that the only thing that really is pending? That, that, that is the fundamental you know, sticking point and I, I think I sent you all a version of the bylaw that had three alternatives. 
for how to address that issue. I think um, Lisa Mead had some comments about that, and I'd like to be able to speak with her. Uh, we're going to try to talk um, probably tomorrow, actually, uh, and uh, go through her comments, and I'll be able to, you know, represent those at, you know, the next time we set up to discuss the bylaw. But I'm hoping we can just pick one of those three alternatives and maybe the simplest one would be the, the better way to go than the more complex table. Uh, but that's for, for you all to decide, I guess. But um, Rachel, yeah. with, if you look at the other timelines, they're all going to go to town meeting. Like they'll all yeah. make it. It's just that we would have to make another meeting that Annalie was going to um, make a suggestion for. You mean a mid 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 month meeting? Yeah. So if you look at the other two, what I'm what I was thinking of is having a meeting on April twelfth. Sure. And then you can. Well, do April that's how we got spring. to marijuana we, because we just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. I mean, and that then one April, we, a public hearing on the twenty sixth. Let me just. You want me to? Yeah. I'll look at the other one. I don't. I don't. Didn't download them. So, Jen, what you're saying on April twelfth, we would have both the public hearing for accessory apartments and our own internal deliberations for solar and site plan review. No, the twelfth would be the public hearing for the planning board for the accessory apartment. Sorry, and then. No, then you would have, sorry, I missed, misspoke. So then the public hearing for the other two would be on April 26th. So, so on the next meeting, April 5th, is where you would review it. Planning board reviews zoning amendment proposal and sets public hearing date. So on April 5th, we will go over the other two and then uh, we'll, you will have a hearing on April 26th. Got it. So the fifth, we we look at site, we 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 finalize site plan review solar. On the twelfth, we have the public hearing for accessory apartments, and on the twenty sixth, we have the public hearing for site plan review and solar. You got it. Which means for any um, business, it would really have to be primarily probably on the. 12th that we only have really one business meeting in April and it has to be at the 12th right and and basically you're you've already looked at a lot of these drafts several times so hopefully it won't be too much discussion okay Jen, does that sound reasonable for people it does Jen can you can you share that timeline with me when you have a second because sure no yeah, definitely mess yeah. up. I, could you I, share that with all of us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't received that. I don't know. If yeah, you, I just sent it to me just today. now so that I could put it up. Yeah, oh, got it. Day and I sent no, it that's, help, that's helpful. Oh. Hey, and but Chris, I, I, I have a question for Chris. You just mentioned, you said something that you had three, I didn't understand what you said about the solar bylaws, three different things that you sent to us. I sent no. you a, a single bylaw that- Right, okay. With, in three alternatives for the solar access issue. Okay. And those okay. are those are to be reviewed by the board and just one of those alternatives would be selected in the final bylaw. So that there are examples from three different communities. I think I looked at Orange, Massachusetts, uh, Cornwall, Connecticut, and a community in Oregon, actually. Okay. It, it is, it's a tough issue. Um, you know, solar access is is enabled by the state's zoning enabling act as as a, um, a a zoning regulation, but nobody seems to have much experience with it in in Massachusetts. So, it's uh, it's been a bit of a struggle to try to figure out how to address that. Okay. Okay. So I guess back to our issues at hand. I think we also then need to vote on the date of the public hearing for the accessory apartments. Is that, I, I believe Jen, isn't that correct? And Chris? 
So I guess it would be if we could have a motion to have the public hearing on accessory apartments on April 12th. So I move that we have we open a public hearing on April 12th to um, present the accessory apartment bylaws suggestion that we are recommended bylaws that we are recommending or not recommending that we are presenting. <laughs> Maybe we'll I second that. that. <laughs> Thank you. That was very, very brave of you. <laughs> Is there any other discussion? Next right. time you're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> okay let's see we'll just uh continue with uh rachel blaine uh uh rachel blaine yes uh and mary cloutier and mary cloutier yes niece mason niece mason yes kathy watrova in on uh, mute my dog was barking, so I muted it. Kathy with trouble, yes. My toddler is barking. Annalie Wolfpool, yes. All right, so we will have our public hearing on accessory apartments on April 12th. Whew, thank you all very much. We got through that, that's good. Two down, two to go. All right, um, next on the agenda is our a &R for Five Industrial Drive West. Deerfield Industrial, and we do have two representatives, the applicant and the applicant's attorney, Mark Reed, and the applicant, Matthew, Matthew. Um, so um, this is something that we just need to uh, endorse. Uh, and Jen, Jen and uh, Bob, you took a look at this first, so maybe do we Hear what you have to say about it or how does how do we approach this discussion maybe mark and can let uh, we look at it and just go through the project so okay. who, who can share it do you want me to share um, it sure sure i'm getting good at this <laughs> watch out jen maybe Oh, and as I understand from talking with Jen and Bob that we need to make sure that the existing structure on the main lot meets our zoning bylaws. And this is an endorsement, not an approval of. <laughs> so who wants to re sort of give an overview? This is Mark Reed from Heritage Land Surveying and Engineering. Uh, I'm looking at uh, the wrong plan. It's oh, not <laughs> wrong one, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. But maybe it should be you after all. Here we so, go. I mean, I can share it if-, if... Yes, you share it. That's better. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so can everyone see this? Let me just make sure. <clears throat> Everyone see the plan now? Yes. Perfect. Great. So um, this is a two parcels of land uh, being at the intersection of Sunderland Road 116 and Industrial Drive. What the applicant Deerfield Industrial LLC is proposing to create one new parcel of land, which is shown on the plan as parcel two having an area of 14.149 acres. Um, it has 230.67 feet along industrial drive. So it meets the zoning requirement for minimum frontage and area um, for the new building lot. The existing dwelling, which I can zoom in on that so that you can kind of see, which is noted, noted as parcel one, um, has an area of 15.797 acres, um, 
which contains the existing building, which houses um, their current building. Um, um, in, <coughs> excuse me. As well as parking and pavement areas. It has lots of frontage along um, Sunderland Road, as well as frontage on Industrial Drive. So again, that does meet all your requirement. I know one question um, relative to uh, the maximum lot coverage. Under your zoning bylaws, the maximum lot coverage is 70%. Um, and that comprises of the building and pavement and parking areas for Atlantic Furniture, which is run, runs out of this facility right now. Um, the plan shows that we have 63.8% uh, coverage. So we're below the maximum of 70% coverage uh, allowed under your zoning. So we feel we're in compliance in all aspects of the zoning to have the board endorse this plan as shown and requested on this plan. So what, what are you doing then? What, what are you changing so far? How do you... So there, this is a new parcel of land, which is lot or parcel two, which will have frontage on uh, industrial drive. Uh, there is no plans for a building at this time on parcel two, uh, but there may be in the future. But for right now, there isn't uh, any. So you want to make it one parcel. So we want to make it two parcels. One containing the existing building, which is Atlantic Furniture is located, and one which is called parcel two, which doesn't have any buildings located on it. Right. Currently, it's one large parcel. Right. And, and so who, isn't this, this is in the expedited, I mean, this is the part of, um, I'm, I'm so confused. Where is it? FedEx down in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's the, it's not the industrial park. It is the industrial it park. Is. It is the yeah. industrial park. Yeah, it is. Yeah, right. it is. It is the industrial park. So, so, okay. Yep. Yeah, here's, I can zoom yeah. on. Yeah, 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 okay. I am looking. <laughs> I'm a, I, it looks like the industrial park, but yeah. so why, so the industrial park is, is operated as a whole, right? No, there's, there's individual lots um, owned by uh, corporations or entities okay. Okay. Um, within that industrial park. Um, so it is a planned industrial park. Yeah. But there is private ownership of the parcels themselves. Too. Can I ask? Thank you, Mark. Yes. Mm -hmm. Kathy? So Deerfield Industrial LLC owns these this one parcel that you want to break into two. One, one has their building on it for their furniture and one is just empty and you want to have its own separate lot empty space Correct. for potential future use. Correct. Okay. Correct. But Atlantic is, isn't the owner. They're a leasee. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Deerfield Industrial LLC owns the property. Yep. And Atlantic Furniture, um, yes runs the, their business out of that. Okay. Does, does um, Deerfield Industrial LLC does not own the Atlantic building, that Atlantic building is owned by Atlantic Furniture? No. No. Uh, Deerfield Industrial owns the buildings and the pavement and everything on there. The property. Yes. Atlantic Furniture. Uh, leases Rent. things. Rent leases it. Yeah. And so the change here is frontage and um, splitting that lot. C correct. Currently on your on your uh, assessors or tax map rolls, it's one large parcel yeah. with about 30 acres containing 30 acres. 
almost 31 acres. So, so the, yes, they want to split it into two parcels, one having 15.7 and the other parcel having with that's vacant right now or proposed to be vacant, it's 14.149 acres. Okay, so now I'm gonna just ask the Deerfield Industrial Park question again. <laughs> so every time something from Deerfield Industrial Park comes before us, Paul Olszewski is here or somebody from that. Um, so so how is how is it that he's not here or not him, but somebody from the, the industrial mm -hmm. park, um, that committee, that, that advisory board or whatever they are. I'm not sure if Paul's still on. No, I'm not sure he is either, but I'm just saying, and I'm just curious, this is just curiosity. You can say it's yeah. none of your business back off. All you have to do is split the property. <laughs> and, and in fact, we're not even doing the splitting. You're doing the splitting. We're just endorsing it, but just curious. I, I st I'm not, not understanding the relationship between that organization and the landowner Deerfield. That's very funny. I never thought of it before that way. Mm -hmm. I always thought of them as being. This Trevor Dedic manages Dedic, yeah. the properties kind of, you know, works with the landowners and all and <clears throat> reviews different things going on there. And I assume they would probably, and they may have approached Dedic. I'm not sure if the owners have yet. But Dedic um, doesn't own it. That's always the thing. No, no. They just, they, they, they were incorporated in the 70s to try and get business and industrial, you know, businesses. And really all the lots are kind of sold now. And, and they're yeah. just, I think, looking to split this one and allow more economic development, yeah. whether it's, you know, part of Atlantic or another, another entity in there. Yeah, rock on. I yep. just, I, I yep. just didn't understand Dedic's part in it always. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Other than they didn't want marijuana. <laughs> right, they kind of oversee. <laughs> True. I mean, that's all I remember is that they didn't want marijuana, and it was uh, the you know yeah. federal blah 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 over and over again. And I'm not so sure that's accurate in the long run, but um, but oh, I know well, I'm sure it's not. Yeah. But at that the time, good. it was huge. Right. You're right. Most You're right. Yeah. <laughs> Dan or Bob, do you have any comments? <clears throat> um, everything looks good to me. So. That's my only comment. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Bob. Jen? Yeah, so um, Bob and I took a, a look at it. And so the things that we look at, which then you all should look at as well, is um, all of the requirements in, in our zoning bylaw for setback and area. And um, just to see that we're, they're keeping that current building um, conforming. And that's it. So looks good. Do we have any other um, questions? I, I, I just have a question. So, and, and it doesn't, it's not relevant for this tonight, but so if someone wants to put a building on that property, they have to consider, can they consider the whole parcel? Because I can barely see it. Isn't, doesn't it say archeological site? Would that come into play? Would that be part of what the 70% or would that, would you not include that in the development? So I, I believe that the way the zoning bylaws uh, read is it's 70% of the parcel area. Mm -hmm. um, so that 70% of the, the parcel would be allowed to be okay. developed. Yeah, uh, I just have a question. I just noticed yes. something. Um, the retention basin would then for lot parcel one would then be is it on parcel two or is that part, is the retention basin still part of parcel? So the, so the retention basin is actually for the entire roadway. It's part of the original um, plans oh, right. for the industrial park. Oh, okay. So yeah, it's, it. shared, it's shared by multiple people. Hmm. Okay. Um, all right. Through an easement. Yes. So then every, all of that would be Denise looked at in the future when and if they want to put anything on parcel two. Correct. Mm -hmm. Right, right. All the fun stuff, stormwater right. runoff and- Right, correct. So, you know, so for instance, you know, to take it one more step here, the turnaround at the cul-de-sac or at the end of the roadway is actually located on parcel two, but it has an easement uh, that for the benefit of the the inhabitants of Deerfield. So 
So it was all part of the industrial park oh. plan. By Dedick. Correct. Correct. There you yes. go. D now I got it. Yep. <laughs> These are good questions. Um, anything else? No. Nope. All right, then um, so we will need a motion and second to endorse the ANR 45 industrial drive. Is that the proper statement? Go, Denise, come on. <laughs> I make That's a motion correct. to endorse the property on part Five Industrial of Drive. Thank you, Five Industrial Drive. I My second. <laughs> Excellent, any other discussion? All right, let's go backwards or let's see, we'll do a different alphabetical. And Mary. Hey, Mary Cloutier, aye. Uh, Denise Mason. Denise Mason, yes. Kathy Wetroba. Kathy Wetroba, yes. Rachel Blaine. Rachel Blaine, yes. And Annalie Wolfful, yes. So we have it unanimously <coughs> endorsed. Um, Matthew and Mark, thank you very much for your participation and clarity. Okay. History. Thank you all and good night. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're moving forward here. Okay, um, let's see, yeah, we still have Chris with us, which is just fine. Next <laughs> on our agenda is um, Chris's contract renewal. And um, as I vaguely understand it, Chris originally had a contract that <clears throat> was to work on solar, site plan review, accessory apartments, green and then green development. Oh, and green development. And then we've gone over it a bit. And with Casey's blessing, we were able to sort of <laughs> put ourselves into a hole. And so Chris, ha we have sent, you all have received a, um, a con draft contract, a renewal contract for him. You all had a chance to look at that. Okay. Um, so again, actually what it is, it's, it's finalizing these three bylaws that we're working on, you know, right as we speak practically, and then any other bylaw work. And it takes, uh, this is through June of 2022, if we need Chris for something else. So any other questions or? It sounds great, looked great. We have thanks to Chris also. All right. Yes. All right. So then I guess we would have a, well, this is the quickest thing of the evening. Um, a motion to approve the contract. Or, or renew. Or or to, renew. I'll move to renew Chris's contract. Thank you for the clarification. Yes. All right. Second that. And any other discussion? Okay, Rachel Blaine. I vote yes, Rachel Blaine. And Mary Cloutier. And Mary Cloutier, yes. Denise Mason. Denise Mason, yes. Kathy Wetroba. Kathy Wetroba, yes. And Emily Wolfkuhl, yes. So you are renewed, Chris. You can send us an invoice. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much for your work. Uh, we certainly. Can do this without you. Okay, and Mary, you're on. Um, you've had some conversations, I understand, about Bloody Brook cleanup. So go for it. Um, well, one of the things that my family and I typically do every time, every year around my birthday, is the Source to Sea cleanup for the Connecticut River, um, which is a fantastic um, effort. If anyone here is interested in that, I'm sure you can Google it. Um, so it got me thinking that we're having um, a lot of conversations around our culverts. I live um, in a neighborhood where drainage is very much on my mind. Um, and so uh, an idea that I had that Trevor also thought was a great idea is if we sort of could find a way to mirror the source to sea cleanups approach to our own bloody brook. Um, we have some uh, you know, sort of bio stuff that we need to think about, the things that clog our culverts. And we also have, unfortunately, 
um, a boatload of trash that could be pulled out and um, taken mm -hmm. care of. So, I mean, that's sort of my nascent vision. Um, and so I was hoping to bring it to this board and I don't know if Trevor's here for this, but I like to think he is. Um, <laughs> and, you know, see what <laughs> Trevor's here to endorse, which is awesome. So I'm wondering, um, you know, <clears throat> I don't know what a process would be for a community effort like this. I don't, I, you know, I assume that there are several steps. Maybe some more veteran members can help us with this, but that is a very, you know, brief sort of overview of my idea and, you know, with Trevor, what Trevor, the conversation that Trevor and I had very briefly. And uh, Kevin right now is applying to conservation, I think, to, um, to have one permit to clean all of our ditches. And we, you know, this is why we developed the uh, mosquito district. Yeah, I know it's long, you know, mosquitoes. So <laughs> everybody talks about that every year. So, we love those mosquito districts. Yeah, right? <laughs> We're kind of using them to get into our ditches and clean them up. So I think it's great. It's, well, yeah. I think it, it was, if, if, if a critter gets us to do the right thing, yeah, they're, they're gonna win That's anyway. Right. We all know, like the maggots, the mosquitoes, <laughs> will, the lice. The they will be here long after they're us. They're <laughs> all gonna be here long before we. Yeah. Uh, so I think um, so. Kevin's waiting, kind of, to find out if he can get that answer. Can we get one permit to get in and do that? And I think, and I think what Anne Mary was talking about is can can uh, other people. There was another woman. I think Karen was asking about this too. I could have the name wrong. Um, was asking about can homeowners kind of dip into their little ditch area and clean out some, you know, any logs that have fallen in and, you know, anything that's stopping up like bro Bloody Brook. We've uh, cut back quite a few of the trees around there that have kind of grown up between the elementary school and the, um, and the town hall memorial to kind of gain back some of our lawn and everything that has been taken over over the years um, and get some of the dead stuff. And a lot of the bittersweet out of there but it, we're left with a lot of stuff to clean out as well and and if you look down in that bloody brook there's there's just so much debris in front of the culverts and all and we wondered could could residents on the, their own walk into their backyard and the, just to try and get water to flow a bit better not going with a big backhoe but you know just as, as homeowners wouldn't, wouldn't do that. But I mean, just if they could do anything possible to clean up their space. Get things moving along. It doesn't Do feel like right? it's in Anybody our purview. Not that it doesn't right. necessarily feel like it's in our purview um, to, to make a declaration in this. I mean, it sounds like it's more in, in uh, the conservation commission. Yeah. Funcom. Yeah, I think it's a great idea, though. You know, they do the Green River cleanup every year. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think it's a great idea. And I think if someone else can do, you know, do that, I mean, I'd certainly be happy to participate. You mm -hmm. know, the, the town would have their services, I would think, you know, to clean yep. up. Yeah. You'd, we'd be supplied with bags yeah. and you just have to and really direction. control how many kids can do that and what mm -hmm. age group. So they, you know. Because the source to see too, there's a lot. There's direction. You, you, they don't just yeah. like go oh, have that rock out. Yeah, right, 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 Pull right. it all out there. Um, right. They set up a grid and they put and they ask you to come in teams, and right. so you right. sort of um, arrange yourself into teams. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some administrating yep. that slices up the um, area of the river into different um, quadrants that they then send you out. Um, they send somebody behind to pick up your trash bags. Nice, uh, yeah. Those, and then the refrigerator. River. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. So um, I guess, you know, what's the process? How do we, you know, what is the next step for reaching out to CONCOM or, you know? I think would put, put yourself on the, or put up, uh, I mean, and we can be part of it too, but I think mm -hmm. that it, it makes more sense. Um, and there must be, and so Trevor, you know, all of the mosquito district, you know, yeah. guidelines, there must be some guidelines. Cause while you say like no homeowner would pull out a backhoe. Yeah. A homeowner with a backhoe might say, yeah, yeah I'm happy to do this. I'm, <laughs> thank you for permission and then goes for it. So, 
I think it, yeah, a lot of it has to do with, you know, with the DEP and just requirements around mm -hmm. touching waterways and wetlands and like disturbing, you know, wild right. natural habitat. So there has to be that, that kind of balance between, uh, you know, digging a massive ditch and like disrupting wetlands versus, you know, just kind of cleaning out the trash yeah. and, the, and, yeah, and yeah, just yeah. some dead trees and limbs trash and stuff that fall in to kind of get water moving a little bit rake, rake back the leaves a little bit um so i i don't know the answer either and i think and and, and mary too we're all like well what do we do where do we go we well and maybe schools maybe we don't think about this for so long because it's such a what was that i missed out I'm sorry, I, it, you keep freezing, so I keep thinking you're done. I'm not trying no. to interrupt you, I'm sorry. <laughs> She's talking over you. <laughs> um, go ahead, Trevor, I don't mean to- No, I'm, I'm done, I've been He's freezing done. up. So. <laughs> so I think maybe there's two things to consider. Like maybe the bittersweet and the uh, chokeweed and all of those things, uh, maybe that's too much to consider. However, getting all of the pieces of um, trash out of there so they're not standing water and creating right. these little places for that the mosquitoes can breed in and, and creating this, you know, somewhat of a structure that um, the biomass gets caught in, right? So in pulling out all of that trash, I mean, you're, you're getting something done um, mm -hmm. without having yes. to sort of, yeah. because I know that there are like um, the knotweed, if you don't, if you mow it, you're actually adding to the problem. So, you know, right. maybe I could, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, um, as much as it makes sense with Conservation Commission, I can't imagine them being the um, organizers and the logistical people and how we could get people who are really uh, invested in environmental stuff, be it with the schools or whatnot, to really mm. uh, spearhead this. It would be good for all of the, the committees, all the boards to be supportive of it, but who can take, who can take um, ownership? Well, Annalie, does it make sense? I mean, I don't know anybody there, but we could probably find out. Does it make sense? How do, how do they organize that for the Green River cleanup, which they do every, every year? So I'm sure that they have a process as well. So it's not like yeah. we reinvent the wheel, as you were saying. True. That's a great thought of like checking in with them and say, do yeah. you, you know, what do you do with DEP? How do you go about this? Is it, do, is there any permit involved? And, and you're right, right. and there may be two kind of prongs. One is like getting the trash out and while you're there kind of removing mm -hmm. a, a, a branch or two, you know, to, <laughs> and leaves uh, versus, you know, like going in and like cleaning the ditches like Kevin wants to do that kind of thing. We could probably contact the uh, mass fish and wildlife too. I mean, on mm -hmm. their website, they talk about invasive species and Great. You know, aquatic species. And, and so I'm sure they have a representative there that may geologically understand our area in particular yeah. and uh, well, you know, what to do and not to do in mm -hmm. regard to cleanup. Great I mean, the best interest could, could be detrimental in some fashion. And you know, Mary, and Mary too, I think that the it is like, it is, you do it with your family. It is a kid thing. Mm -hmm. It works really well with students in the schools in town, which mm -hmm. Frontier would be a great project. It would be a great, great project for the elementary school, the private schools. I mean, that really would not be, that's how I do source to cease with mm -hmm. my school. Oh, so it's, okay. it, it, it's a great kid thing. Um, and of course, as those of us who are old enough, we know that that's how the anti-litter thing got going, yeah. right? It was all about training kids not to throw wrappers on the ground. Yeah. So I think that it is a great, you know, that between CONCOM, DP, fit, the fit, mass game, what is it mm -hmm. again? Whatever catches Fish and wildlife, yeah. Fish and wildlife, them. And the schools kind of making it two pronged kind of community and, mm -hmm. you know, educationally uh, sound. Also to highlight the any kind of opportunity that we can to uh, improve a situation that isn't, you know, isn't great with water flow and through mm -hmm. town. Yep. So it just, it, it educates everybody. It, it highlights it. Yep. And yep. then, um, and then get somebody who would keep us from doing stupid things. <laughs> yes. Good luck. Get, get on track. <laughs> yeah. so I love I this. Keep me out of it. 
Yeah. And Mary, I could check in with Kevin and see where he's at with the yeah. DEP yeah. on that. That yeah. Uh, and I'll reach out, yeah, and I will reach out to um. I'll find. Uh, oh, my brain. I know it's late. Brain on COVID. <laughs> it, there's all kinds of things about it now. <laughs> You know, so I contact the Green River cleanup people and um, oh, great. They're yeah. person and they're an admin person. And I'm, um, you know, people like that typically will yeah. give you a hey, lot. The watershed, the, the watershed is another one too. The, um, mm -hmm. I think that, anyway. Yeah. So can we put it back that. on the agenda for next week? We'll report out and maybe think about like what type of year, like next action steps, like see what we yeah. found out and then court, chart a course from there. Yeah. Nice. Great. Yeah. Wait, next week? No, next no, meeting. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Wait, wait, I don't see. You know what? I think this is, I'd like to use this as a springboard and continue after this to, you know, to really involve the town into just cleanup. Because my husband and I, we walk up and down Lower Road and we take trash okay. bags. You know, we make take Thank one you. for trash and one for recycling. And I'll tell you, there's other stuff, you know, people will, you know, when you get it farther in the road, they, they dump their tires or, yeah. you know, it's just, it's horrible. But yeah. I think if we could, you know, just continue, yeah, you know, really encourage people to do that all around town. And I'm sure some people already do that, but yeah, we, we, we wrote, made a fence and it wasn't to keep anybody in or out. It was to keep refrigerators out. Because people, yeah, the moment they see a place they can dump <laughs> a refrigerator, and I'm not, that's why I was joking about the refrigerators. Yeah, yep. I know. Yep. It's horrible. <laughs> True. Ugh. All right, and Mary, we'll put it on the um, April 5th follow-up um, old business. And thank you. I'm really pleased. I think yes. we all are, Trevor Ann and Mary. for yeah, um, thanks. It's exciting. I hope it comes together. With this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. One way or another, we'll do it. Thank you. All right. Um, one more, I think, um, item that uh, if you can indulge me with. Um, uh, when I was elected for being the chair, um, one of the first things I did was talk to most of you and members of the select board and staff in the town offices as well as consultants. I haven't really talked to everybody I wanted to, but I wanted to sort of find out what people's thoughts were on directions for the planning board, things that we do well, things that we could do maybe a little differently. And um, I certainly did find some similar themes, which are really nice. And I wanted to share those with you briefly now and similar to what we just did sort of talk about next steps. Um, I also certainly want to thank all of you for your support, both um, in my reluctant acceptance of your nomination, <laughs> as well as uh, going forward with um, Having you mean a when collaborative... voice did it on you? <laughs> <laughs> we, we <laughs> collaborative effort, as we know, this is a team meeting, um, or team team effort. Um, so my findings, in no particular order. Um, one thing for sure, there was a, a strong feeling that meetings should be not any more than two hours. That after two hours, we just get to be unproductive, and and, and we're just spinning our wheels. Um, another uh, statement that was echoed in different ways was that we really are absorbed by development and we don't do a lot of planning. Um, and that one, of, one of the quotes I thought was good is that zoning isn't static, it needs to change with the times. And our town plans need to help guide our decisions. But in fact, another finding was or statement was that we really are working with outdated plans, processes, bylaws. Um, particular things that were brought up is that um, our planning, our, our site plan review, our um, special permit applications and instructions were last looked at in 2014. The master plan for the town was is over 20 years old. Our housing production plan was also 2014. Oh, there was mm -hmm. something special about 2014. Um, particular zoning laws that sort of irk people, drainage, signage, mixed use, green space, um, so those are areas in particular that people mentioned that we really um, need to help guide so that we can be more proactive rather than just reactive or more contemplative. Um, certainly, and we've already discussed this a little bit in some of our previous meetings, that we need information with adequate time to prepare for the meeting. Um, and that means not the day before, the day of, that we actually have time 
Um, and also that we should have pertinent information in front of us. I think Zoom has actually helped with that, with um, having being able to script, share the screen. Um, so that's helpful. Um, a strong feeling that um, taking advantage of training opportunities, um, as much as we sort of talk about open meeting laws, it seems like there still is um, a fair amount of the devil's in the details and, the, and confusion about when does open meeting laws really, really impact a certain situation that we're in front of. Um, and also a feeling that FERCOG has a lot more training to offer that we don't take advantage of. Mm -hmm. um, my takeaways from all of that is, first of all, as I thought about my own role is obviously recognizing that I'm <laughs> far from expert on a lot of this. And so I'm seeing my role as being a facilitator really and bringing all of us together, bringing together planning board meeting members, but also professionals, staff, residents. Um, I want to be able to facilitate informed discussion so that we can have um, decisions that are fair and legal and enforceable. <laughs> Um, and of course, that's where it really is, again, a, a strong group effort. Um, in order to have efficient meetings, I think we all need to do our homework, but it seems like people do a really good job on that. So um, I think I checked that box off. Um, but we also really do need to and want to rely on um, regulatory input from the staff, in particular, Jen and, and Bob. Um, they are the professionals who can um, certainly add boots on the ground um, perspective on the, the issues that we're talking about, sometimes more theoretical. Um, and also we need to be certain that all of the applications, all of the things that come before us are in fact complete by the time, you know, from when we look at them, that we don't accept, we, we aren't deliberating things that in fact are incomplete if, if an application is, is incomplete. Um, I think in terms of efficient meetings, if we're stumped on an issue, it's good for any one of us to sort of bring forward the question of whether or not it should be tabled until we get more um, complete information um, rather than just trying to grasp and grapple if we're feeling like we're in the dark. Um, and at times that may mean that we need to have meetings more than once a month. I really am appreciative when it can happen, but also respectful that we all have lots of other commitments. Um, in terms of the outdated plans and processes, as I'm racing through here, um, I think we need an inventory. We need a list of, of what all is, uh, you know, maybe really out of date and really needs to be addressed. And then, and then as a board, we decide maybe how we want to, to um, proceed with prioritizing um, and, and delegating pro, you know, responsibilities for doing some of these things. It might mean that we need to have a work group to just sort of figure out what's this inventory list of the work group that could meet once or twice and report back to the, the planning board. And um, also potentially ask um, Lisa Mead and her colleagues at her firm um, about maybe some more specific open meeting training and um, you know it wouldn't necessarily just have to be for the planning board really for anyone that um, the town would want to include with that so that's what I found first of all I guess does that sound like it's on target are there things that um, in my motor mouth here I over yeah. overlooked or um, yeah Annalie I think you know we've we've had we've um, uh, not to fight open meeting, but we we've had this conversation. And first of all, I like the idea of I like getting all the information by close of business Thursday. I think it's respectful to our town, to Jen, to the town employees, and I think it's respectful to the planning board members. And if we don't get it in time, a table it's tabled to the next meeting. As far as I'm concerned, that's unless it is just a real exception to the rule. But I think I think we really should do that. And I think it needs to be on the website so that we inform people so that they know what to expect. 
And the other thing, you know, you've done a terrific job, I think, you know, listing all of this, but my thoughts are, you're the chairperson, and I don't think you need to have the weight of the world on your shoulders. And so my, you know, my question is, is there a job description for the chairperson? Is there a job description for the vice chair? I think it's very, you know, it's, it's pretty clear with Ann Mary, you know what your job is, you know what that is, but I don't know exactly. Is there a description? I'm used to working under job descriptions and responsibilities. So, I asked Casey if there was a job description and there isn't one. Can there be, or do other planning boards have job descriptions? You know, I'm just sort of curious about that because, you know, I, I think if, you know, if you think that you are responsible for all of this, that's a, that's a quick burnout. I mean, for anybody, yeah, yeah, so it may not be you, it, it may not be you being chair all the time, you know, next year or two years from now, it could be someone else. So it's sort of nice to know what, what's the, what are the responsibilities? I have no idea. Trevor? Trevor? Well, so I just, I really, I really appreciated you reaching out, you know, to me and I, I, my strong suit is not zoning and planning. I, it's, I'm learning all along with you as different cases come up and we discuss different things and how they impact the town. Um, but I, I did love the idea of the, of the trainings. I just want to say from the select board as a town, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, my role in the town is I want to support our boards. Um, and with whatever training, because I learned from them too, when Adam Costa can come on and talk to the planning board and the zoning board about different things, we all learn and we all serve our residents and our applicants and our future businesses um, and our current businesses much better when we're educated and we can't know everything and it, it always changes and zoning laws change and different cases come before the courts and um, I just think we all do better when we, when we can take time to learn. And, and my suggestion was like, hey, every third meeting or something on an off meeting week, if, if you can plan out through the year, um, we would support like funding to have experts come and talk about, you know, maybe you single out a really good planning board that you've seen in the state that's doing really good things. And maybe, uh, maybe the chair comes and gives a talk a little bit about how they run their meetings or, or if you watch other meetings, I think Jen had a good, um, um, you know, even for our board, for the select board is like you find, you find, you, know, you can surf all this stuff is on YouTube now. So you can just surf and just kind of see how other people run their boards and what they're dealing with and find different ways. But I thought of like bringing a lawyer in to talk about zoning changes or, or different things that are coming up. We always, from the select board's point of view, want to support your board, uh, especially in, in any board, um, any committee, just with all the training that we can, because we learn from it too. So any opportunities you have, we want to be there to support you all. Great, thanks. So I think we could probably for sure put open meeting training. <laughs> we all can learn from that. <laughs> right, no right. But um, Annalie, I was going to say, you know, I, I, I really, I love the, the idea of having more training. I would really, you know, appreciate having more training. And um, I also like the fact that, you know, talking about the master plan and things that are, um, you know, prioritizing things. And, you know, I like to be proactive as opposed to being reactive. And I know mm -hmm. that it's, you know, it's, it's a balance between the two with something like this. But I think by really taking a good look at the master plan, I think that would be a really good yeah. direction and I, that's not just us i mean that would be right. in collaboration with the select board right yes yes, yes. i love that cool that would be good i don't know rachel and mary kathy any other thoughts camille i do think that we are in a you know we're in this um especially with treehouse um and Treehouse is a great opportunity for the town, but it, it also presents mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and it, uh, more foot traffic, which yep. will bring us to more um, retail opportunities, which is great, but it complexifies the sure. way we want to proceed. So I think that, you know, I, I, this has not been a particularly anti, I don't Trevor will agree, but anti-development board, we have not been, um, but, um, you know, we're also that's our job is to to you know proceed in a measured way 
that uh, allows access for people to come to this town to do the things that they want to do here and also to capture uh, a certain amount of um, of sense and reason as a, as that as those proposals come before us so you know I, I i i think it's interesting the whole idea of proactive versus reactive the proactive part of this is to look at our bylaws mm -hmm. to always look at our bylaws. the reactive part that's our job like that is our job is to react to the presentation of right. of permitting needs mm -hmm. of whatever so it is perforce a kind of a reactive job, right. but as we look at the bylaws, in, I think that's what's so exciting about this little bubble of time that we've had and we've been able to really do without a lot of big projects in front of us. We haven't, we've had one big project in front of us after another for a few years and it's just been grisly. So this is really exciting and this is the proactive part. And yeah. the mo there's, in, a, in a heartbeat, it's gonna reactive again. That's just what happens. Yeah. So uh, well, I get that. It's a ballot. It's a yeah, balance. It is a balance. Yeah. So, so I, I, I'm all in. I'm all in for looking at whatever we can do, you know, a few years. Yeah. Whatever we can do to make sure that the bylaws say things that we think, you know, it makes sense that supports a decision making process when, in fact, we have to react to a pro project. Mm. Yeah. Good. Um, all right. Uh, well, I think that, I mean, how do people feel about it? It does seem that there are a lot of um, things that are sort of, uh, that need our attention and even just figuring out again, what an inventory list of those things are and trying to figure out what the priority is. I wonder if there might be, I don't know, one or two of you who could work with me and maybe Jen to just, um, just create the list and then we bring that back with maybe a propose some proposals or for some discussion on how we might want to proceed with just starting to chip away. Does that seem like, I don't think it would be um, yeah. a burdensome, again, maybe one or two meetings at the very most. And it would be a work group from what I understand from a, mm -hmm. our previous training session with Adam. It's not a subcommittee and we have to also make sure with however it's posted or whatnot that we're right compliant with open meeting i'd be happy to to do that great if thanks Anisha. okay <laughs> yeah all right i'd be interested too cool. I, would, right. I, I actually would as well if that doesn't make too many people no. um, but like rachel you know the um in a couple months, I'll be more free. <laughs> like, not that this can wait a couple months. I'll be in our, like, see you tomorrow, Kath. <laughs> back in the, back in the, on the heat, so to speak. All right, well, I think, yeah, right, potentially, I mean, uh, you know, a town meeting coming up and we, we will have some planning certainly for that and want to have a little breathing room in case something takes a little bit longer with any of our current bylaws. So um, good. So maybe Jen, you and I can talk some about how to sort of get it, it rolling it and funneled, funneled through me. Great. And then I can send everything oh. to Anna Lee. You know, it just. You know what? What? Hold on a sec. Oh. And have a conversation about really, um, especially for site plan reviews, really making that, um, you know, a, a walk through sort of um, process that's really clear to all of us members. That would be great. Ah. So, so we had one of these a gajillion years ago. What? I was asking Pat, I said, because I knew you had that. And I'm like, where are those? Like, let's make this book because I keep finding documents and sending them to Anna Lee because I'm like, this will be good to read. This tells you about site plan review. And this oh, would be I love good. that. You know, no, but and this is hysterical. I'm going to just tell you that. And and this is, is I hope John Baronis, if you're listening, I love you. But he used to always, we would like update something and then <laughs> he'd be like, okay, Pat, here, fix my book. Because <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> got fixed your own book, John. <laughs> I, I have so many like just papers slid in here. And so it may be ultimately, and I think we even might've had a digital copy, but ultimately. Can you drop that off and I can kind of parse through what. Be sure. great. It's so not updated. I'm embarrassed. Like Don't I could be make fun of John, but the <laughs> fact of the matter is I just went, they'd be like, okay, here's new pages. And unless Pat had us all like pull it out and turn it to the page and then, but it is a great, it's a great resource. I still right. go through it, even okay. though it's outdated. Cool. Well, that's um, not quite sure to, I don't want to give this as a to do yet, but it may be that we'll be sending out a request for any of you just to send in a, you know, um, a list of, okay, here's stuff that I think we really need to address, but we'll get, get going on that a little bit more after I talk with. The neat thing for this is that all that setbacks, frontage, it's right here. So you're just looking it up. You don't have to, like, if you're like nice. me and numbers, you know, like that meld together at a certain point that you just look great. And there it is. So great. when I look at this, um, you know, frontage requirements and RA frontage requirements and C2, anything like that. Um, so that, okay. that, that, that I, I think it is really helpful. I think, and, and it, the process of, you know, anything like that, the process of putting it together actually helps to, to reveal the mm -hmm. things that you need to do. So yeah. that might be helpful. Mm -hmm. All right, so you can share that with Jen. Excellent. And I'll okay. Yeah. <laughs> you. Oh, um, what, what else? What else haven't you told us, Rachel? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> As I always tell my students, I I have forgotten more than you ever knew <laughs> about. Um, oh my god! But I do I, the housing production plan. I have that, and it's in the other room. But I just, I literally, I opened up a box. I was like, oh, it was sitting right there on the top. So, and it's, it's just the executive summary. It's nothing mm -hmm. glamorous, but it did point to the low hanging fruit of, of accessory apartments. So figure that we've worked on that for, since, you know, 2015. Wow. wow. All right, cool, onward. So our next meeting is um, February, or February, April 5th. Lisa Mead may or may not join us. We'll certainly have site plan review and solar. And I think there's one other A&R that is coming up then and whatever else happens. So uh, I, I, don't, uh, I don't know that there's any other business re not reasonably anticipated 40 hours prior. Nope, all right. So I guess, can we have a motion to adjourn? Oh, I move we adjourn. <laughs> it's not even nine o'clock. Woo! I mean, uh, come on, up. this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks a bunch of Anna, second and unanimous. I second it, yep. Yeah. Aye. Okay. All right, Aye. everybody. I, I. Have a nice rest of your evening. Sleep Thank nice. you, Emily. Bye, everybody. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Bye. 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 Bye.